your stuff. Yeah. Good. Maybe yours will be faster because this guy was pretty, pretty slow. All right, welcome to the session on museums this afternoon. Um, we're only running about 10 minutes behind, so I think we should do uh, pretty well. My name is Rosemary Carlton. I'm your moderator for this afternoon. Uh, I think we have a wonderful lineup of people for um, this session. Before we go any further, though, I do want to make, um, make sure that I thank someone that, who is one of the people who is very much responsible for having us all together here these four or five days, and that's Steve Henriksen over here, who has been, um, he's going to be one of the speakers at this session as well. But um, um, I think it's a great uh, honor and privilege to be here and take part in this conference this week. And we are going to go ahead and we're going to get started with our first speaker, so we won't get uh, running behind. First speaker is um, Robert. Cassell, and he is a professor of anthropology and the Gregory Anberg Wittenberg Curator of Northern American Archaeology at the University of Pennsylvania Museum uh, of Archaeology and Anthropology. His research interests include issues surrounding Native American identity, archaeological representation, and material culture. He has received grants from the American Philosophical Society, the University Research Foundation, and the University Museum. His most recent publications are Archaeological um, Semantics, 2006, an edited book, Archaeologies of the Pueblo Revolt, uh, Identity, Meaning, and Renewal in the Pueblo World. Today, he will be speaking on um, Louis Shotridge, a local resident from around the turn of the uh, 20th century, and his association with the University of uh, Pennsylvania Museum. Uh, help me welcome Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, I too would like to follow her lead and thank Steve Hendrickson and Sergey Khan, who's, who's unfortunately not here, for the invitation to participate in this remarkable conference. Uh, it's just amazing to see everyone here and the kinds of information that's being shared. It's just fantastic. And we feel, we from the University of Pennsylvania Museum feel very privileged to be part of this. Louis Shotridge, Louis Shotridge is a well-known figure in the history of American ethnology. He is the first Northwest Coast Indian to have received anthropological training and the first to gain employment by a museum. While at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, he interacted with such leading figures as Franz Boas, Edward Sapir, George Byron Gordon, and Frank Speck. He assisted uh, Boaz is compiling, in compiling the first reliable Klingit uh, grammar. Um, in the course of leading, oh, thank you. I see, okay. In the course of leading three museum expeditions to Alaska and British Columbia, which Lucy Williams, my colleague, will discuss in her presentation, Shotridge collected over 300 ethnographic objects and published 11 articles on various aspects of Northwest Coast culture. He also kept remarkably detailed notes consisting of photographs and file cards containing linguistic data, genealogies, collections data, oral history, myths, and legends. Shotridge has been featured prominently in books, dissertations, scholarly papers, um, newspaper articles and magazine articles. A play has even been written about his life. 
Uh, much of this interest is due to, the contra due to the contradictions as a Klingit man working for an East Coast museum and collecting objects of everlasting esteem from his own people. His life has been appropriated by many different uh, individuals, scholarly and native alike, as an object lesson. In my presentation today, I discuss Schottrich's activities at the University of Pennsylvania Museum, focusing particularly on his exhibits and his lectures. These areas have been largely neglected by previous scholars, but are essential in order to develop a full understanding of his work. I suggest that through his exhibits and lectures, Schottrich actively shaped the representation of Northwest Coast peoples for different East Coast audiences. His goal was to raise up Northwest Coast peoples alongside the great civilizations of the world. To accomplish this, he crafted different personae to mediate popular prejudices and misunderstandings. This, this thesis is, con is consistent with Elizabeth Seton's recent argument that Schottrich embodies a post-colonial subjectivity in which he developed multiple roles, each appropriate for the expectations of particular audiences. In order to appreciate Schottrich's ex exhibition philosophy, it is first necessary to review the history of the American section exhibits of the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Unfortunately, this history is not well documented. The University, the University Museum was founded in 1889, and the first exhibit was curated by Charles C. Abbott, curator of North American archaeology. It was located in a single room in College Hall. And this isn't the photograph, unfortunately. The exhibit consisted of prehistoric artifacts from the Delaware Valley. So they were Lenape, Delaware Indian artifacts. In 1890, Abbott curated an expanded exhibit, which is here, in the Furness Library. It was organized according to the, quote, characteristic forms and materials of antiquities by state. It also included ethnographic objects to help the viewer contextualize the prehistoric ones. Later, exhibits were devoted to cliff dwellers and to the, quote, lost civilizations of Key Marco from Florida. Both of these were curated by Frank Hamilton Cushing, who later on went on to fame because of his Zuni ethnography. Uh, the new museum building opened in 1899, and these exhibits were reinstalled to great fanfare. In 1903, George Byron Gordon was hired as curator of general ethnology. Desirous of enhancing the Native American collection, he invited George G. High to make a loan of his vast collection to the museum. An agreement was drafted in 1907, and in return for the loan and the gift of duplicate specimens, High was appointed vice president of the board of managers and given gallery space. Gordon assumed that this loan would eventually become a gift and focused his collective acti collecting activities on those areas not well covered by the High collection, particularly the Arctic. Between 1910 and 1916, the museum exhibited the High collection in two rooms in the west wing of the museum. The curator of the exhibit is not recorded. However, Gordon, along with Mark Harrington and George Pepper, uh, assistants to High, were likely major um, players in this. One of these rooms was devoted to Plains Indian culture and shows cases of clothing, shields, and headdresses organized by tribe here. And the other was a catch-all for the rest of North America and exhibited North, Northeast birch bark canoes, California baskets, and Midwestern finger woven sashes, among other things. Schottrich jo uh, joined the museum during the high period. Hired by Gordon in 1911 as a part-time assistant, um, one of his first duties was to build models of two Northwest Coast villages. Although he had no formal training, Schottrich created superb models of Haina, a Haida community on Haida Gwaii, featured here, and Klukwan, um, his own village, um, uh, featured here. These models are exquisitely detailed down to the ads marks on the cedar planks. The Klukwan model depicts three famous houses in the central portion of the village. These are the whale house of the Ganaktedi clan, the killer whale fin, fin house, uh, and the grizzly bear house, both of the Kaguantan. The interior of the grizzly bear house um, is left open to reveal the grizzly bear screen, a smaller killer whale screen, and the four house posts. The model also included grave houses, houses for drying fish, canoes, and people performing daily activities. In 1916, High received a substantial inheritance and took his collection north to uh, New York, where he found th founded the Museum of the American Indian High Foundation in the Bronx. This is now the basis for the new National Museum of the American Indian. The loss of the High Foundation was a severe blow to the University of Pennsylvania Museum, and it required a major reinstallation of the American section. 
This was in process in 1918 when Gordon wrote Shot Ridge in Alaska to inform him that the Northwest Coast Collection was being installed in one of the exhibition rooms previously used for the High Collection and that the new exhibit was going to include the new objects that he was in the process of collecting. The installation was completed sometime before 1912. The American section exhibits occupy the four rooms in the western half of the building. So my right is the west, actually. Um, the first room to the right of the main entrance contained South American collections. The second contained Western, Southwestern, Prairie, and Eastern uh, Native American collections. And the third room com contained Eskimo collections, chiefly from Alaska. And the fourth contained Northwest Coast uh, material along with uh, Copper Eskimo and some other um, Eskimo groups. Shotridge prepared detailed plans and inventories of the Eskimo and North American, uh, um, Northwest Coast exhibit. And here's a diagram of what he um, put together. It's clear from his documentation that Gordon organized the exhibits by object type. For example, case 25, which you can see kind of in the top middle there, contained nine ceremonial hats. These included the killer whale hat, undersea grizzly bear hat, murrelet hat, ganook hat, uh, loon spirit hat, barbecuing raven hat, and the raven on the roof hat from different clans from the Sitka and um, uh, Huna and um, Klukwan areas. In 1928, Gordon invited Shotridge to curate the reinstallation of the North, Northwest Coast exhibit. This may be the first time that a Northwest Coast native exhibited his own culture in a museum setting. Shotridge used this opportunity to illustrate the fundamental principles of Tlingit society, the moiety system, and what he called the aesthetic emotions underlying Tlingit narrative art. Although there are no recorded photographs, Shotridge described his exhibit method in one of his articles in some detail. He placed the raven moiety objects according to rank in cases on the right side of the main aisle, and these included the raven of the roop hat of the Kliknakadi, representing culture, the whale hat of the Kliknakadi, emphasizing greatness, the sea lion hat of the Kliknakadi, representing endurance, and the frog hat of the Kiksadi, representing persistence. In a case on the left side of the aisle, he placed the eagle moiety objects. Uh, these included the eagle hat of the Kaguantan, representing determination, the grizzly bear hat of the Tequadi, representing power, and the wolf hat of the Kaguantan, uh, signifying courage. In addition, he exhibited the headdress known as the Lord of Hawks and the Ganook hat, which represents the most ancient being in Klingit mythology. He also exhibited in a small case the hat of Shahihi, the first woman diplomat, and in another the hair pieces of Seit Lin, um, the first, um, I'm sorry, the famous bride of Tongas. Um, further cases were de devoted to wood carving, wearing apparel, the arts of weaving and quill embroidery, feast dishes, war implements and trophies, shaman paraphernalia, and ceremonial headdresses. Shotridge's exhibit lasted only three years. By 1930, Horace Jane, the new director of the museum, wrote Shotridge in Alaska about the, to, about the possible renovation of the Northwest Coast Hall. In a little, in a little, little over a year later, Jane wrote again to inform him that the Klingit exhibits had been reinstalled in the Old Plains Indian uh, Gallery. The cases were more dramatic, featuring hats, clothing, baskets, feast dishes, and a staff. You can see the wolf staff here. Um, despite the interest provided the, by the range of the different object types, the basic social principle was violated since eagle and moiety, raven moiety objects were indiscriminately mixed together um, in this context without any sensibility of how they may be used in a um, memorial um, um, party. In addition, Shotridge's uh, labels were edited down to provide less detailed accounts. I now want to turn to a discussion of Shotridge's role as a lecturer. In 1911, the University Museum began a series of experiments to extend its educational mission beyond the university and to embrace the city of Philadelphia. This project proved very successful. From January to June of 1913, 1,331 school children were brought to the University Museum. These school children ranged in age from third graders to high school seniors. The museum provided a, uh, a choice of 11 lectures, each lasting 40 minutes and illustrated with what they called lantern slides at the time. Following the lecture, 30 or 40 museum objects were used to discuss cultural origins and methods of manufacture and then passed around among the children. For the younger children, the most popular of these lectures were those on the American Indian. 
According to Gordon, this was because, quote, all children are interested in Indians and have their imagination stimulated by the mere mention of Indian. Um, but even more stimulating for the children was the fact that the students were able to learn about their subject directly from two native instructors, Louis and Florence Shotridge. Indeed, the Shotridges often dressed up in Plains Indian costume as they led their tours. Here we have an example of Indians playing Indian in order to appeal to the de desires and expectations of their popular audience in Philadelphia. Gordon wrote that this feature was a, quote, immediately popular with the children who became greatly attached to the Indians and established at once the most friendly relations. So you have to place this in context. Four of Shotrich's public school lectures are preserved in his unpublished papers. These are Alaska and the, the country and its people, the American territory of Alaska, its people and its history, the first white man, and Moldy Head, uh, the adventures of a live and pond in the salmon world. This story is also sometimes called Moldy Tail. The Downhowers have analyzed his museum journal articles and revealed that his in he intentionally adopted archaic English and poetic diction in order to attempt to retrain the integrity of the original Tlingit oratorical style. In his public school lectures, Shotridge adopts a more accessible conversational tone and in places engages directly with the students. For example, in his presentation on Alaska, the country and its people, he begins with a personal anecdote. He relates that when he was a nine-year-old boy, his father took him on a fur trading trip up to the Tanana people. His father told him to go off and play with the other children. He quickly found a group of boys and stood back watching them play. One boy came forward and started pulling on his red neckerchief that was around his neck. Shabich couldn't understand what he was saying and thought that he was being threatened. So he struck him and they began fighting until a man fluent in both Tanana and Klingit broke it up. The man de demanded that both boys explain what had happened. After listening to their stories, he turned to Shotridge and said that the boy only wanted to buy the handkerchief and had offered him a beaver skin as payment. Shotridge was deeply embarrassed because of the misunderstanding and me immediately took off the handkerchief and gave it to the boy. He then related that he and this boy became good friends and that he even saw him during his last collecting trip for the museum. He used this story as evidence for the linguistic diversity of Alaska and the importance of respecting other people's cultures. The story of Moldy Head is well known among Klingit people. It was recorded by Swanton in 1905 and has been recently published in a book by Sea Alaska Institute. Uh, and as you know from the Downhowers, it's been used in the um, school curricula. It is generally agreed to be a Kiksadi story um, from here in Sitka. Um, Shotridge's version is very similar to the Swanton version. It possesses the same 10 structural elements as uh, those that are identified that by the Downhowers. It differs primarily with respect to its framing. Shotridge presents it as a story that he was told as a child by his father's servant, Usha. Shotridge uses the story didactically not only to teach Klingit morals and values, but also to encourage the students, the children, to consider the parts of the story that articulate with the morals that they themselves have received in their own education. In conclusion, Shotridge was a complex individual whose life resists cultural appropriation. There's no doubt that he shared in the salvage ethno ethnological ethic of Gordon. This view closely articulated with his observation that Klingit clan system was weakening and was being replaced by more corporate forms of social organization. Uh, even though he was wrong about this, uh, the clan system certainly survives and this conference is testimony to that. Um, he, even though he was wrong, he was nonetheless committed to the survival of his people in the modern world. And for this, he of course was elected as president of the A&B in 1930. In Philadelphia, he actively took advantage of the opportunities available to him to educate the greater Philadelphia community about Native Americans in general and Northwest Coast cultures in particular. His 1928 exhibit was structured according to the fundamental principles of Klingit culture, the moiety system. It also emphasized the relationships between objects and culture by high... I think she was saying it's like the law. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Lucy Fowler of Williams. Uh, Lucy Fowler, and she is also uh, from the University of Pennsylvania uh, Museum. 
Uh, she is um, the Jeremy A. Uh, Sutherloff Keeper of American Collections at the University of Pennsylvania um, Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. She has a PhD, or she is a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania where her dissertation research focuses on historical and contemporary Pueblo textiles. She has received grants and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the School of American Research, the University of Pennsylvania, the Department of Art Anthropology, and the University Museum. Her most recent publications include Native American Voices on Identity, Art and Culture, Objects of Everlasting Esteem, 2005, and a Guide to the North American Ethnographic Collections of the University of Pennsylvania Museum, 2003. She's the mother of two young boys and lives near Philadelphia. Her presentation today is on... Thank you so much, Rosemary. Can you all hear me? Okay. Louder? Okay. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank Steve Henriksen and also Sergei Khan for inviting me to come here to speak about Shot Ridge today. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to be here in Sitka, uh, which was the home for Lewis Shot Ridge for so many years. So thank you. Um, I also want to thank the many Tlingit people who have been my teachers as I have come here uh, maybe four or five times over the last few years. Um, while I have not had specific conversations with them about Lewis Shotridge necessarily, they have been amazing teachers in many ways. Um, and specifically, I would like to thank Harold Jacobs, Terry Rothkar, Herman and Vida Davis, Andy Gamble. Um, let me check because I don't want to forget anyone. Just a minute, please. Um, Edward John, Garfield George, uh, Nora and Richard Downhower, and also Sue Thorson. Um, I also want to thank my museum colleagues, Bob Purcell and Stacey Espenlob, um, who've helped me get ready for this presentation. Um, also, as you heard today, there's, you know, there's controversy about Lewis Shotridge, and it's not easy to come here and talk about him. And they've given me some strength to be able to come and do that with you today. Um, finally, I want to say how delighted I am with the title of this conference, Sharing Our Knowledge. Uh, my knowledge of Lewis Shotridge is not very deep, and I need your help um, in developing that. And I hope that this can be an ongoing conversation. And anybody who has information or memories or um, just would like to talk about it, I would really welcome that. So with that, I'll go ahead with my presentation. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm running two things at once here. Okay. Um, Lewis Shotridge was a high-ranking Tlingit Kogwantan who was employed to make collections for the Penn Museum over a period of 17 years from 1915 to 1932. His father belonged to the Ganaktedi clan of the Raven Moiety and was the hereditary chief of the Klukwan Whale House. His mother belonged to, oops, sorry. His mother belonged to the Kogwantan clan of the Eagle Side and was a member of the Finn House. Within the academy, Shotridge is known for his success in acquiring what is often called the best Tlingit collection in a public institution. Inside Tlingit communities, however, his name is controversial and even reviled for the same reasons, but seen from a different angle, his overzealous collecting practices in his home village of Klukwan. This paper introduces Lewis Shotridge's Tlingit collections at the Penn Museum in their entirety, his photographs, his historical texts, and his clan regalia, and examines his field methods and practices over time. By doing so, I want to reveal Shotridge's overarching vision to record a comprehensive Tlingit social history that represented all Tlingit geographical divisions. I argue that a comprehensive view of his fieldwork is necessary in understanding Shotridge's unique contribution as a Tlingit historian. I will begin by introducing his fieldwork, including three museum expeditions, and then briefly outline his collections of photographs, written documents, and objects. I also introduce the Penn Museum's current plan to create a digital archive of the tangible products of Shotridge's work and to make them accessible to Tlingit people and to the general public. My title, invokes, my title today invokes the words spoken in the Tlingit Kuiks, 
or potlatches as clan regalia become atu and are physically passed by ancestors to members of the living generation. I am grateful to have had the opportunity to observe this process in several, several potlatches here in Southeast in the past five years and invoke the concept with respectful and sincere hope that Lewis Shotridge's archives at Penn can be used, enlivened, and newly appreciated by future generations of Tlingit people and scholars. And as Shotridge himself would have wished, that these important historical documents can serve a purpose once again in Tlingit communities. Okay, field work from 1915 to 1932. Lewis Shotridge conducted three expeditions for the Penn Museum, totaling 11 years of field work. The first ran for four years from 1915 to 1919, and the second from 1922 to 1927. The third and shortest of the expeditions began in 1930 and ended with the Great Depression of 1932. Lewis Shotridge set out on his first collecting trip in the summer of 1915. He was equipped with instructions by Museum Director Gordon to conduct a thorough study of the Tlingit people and to make collections of their arts and industries. Shotridge subscribed to the salvage anthropology model and, he, and Gordon supported Shotridge, Shotridge's ex ethnography and collecting endeavors from this point of view. Through his associations at Penn, Shotridge had already had two years of training in museum and anthropological methods, and had worked for Franz Boas to develop the first accurate Tlingit linguistic phonology. The expedition was sponsored by John Wanamaker, founder of Wanamaker's department stores and members of the museum, a member of the museum board. During the expedition's three years, Shotridge received a monthly salary and his collecting expenses were paid for by the institution. Shotridge and his wife Florence established their expedition headquarters in the northern Tlingit community of Haines. This region was their home and both had attended the Presbyterian Missionary School there. Shotridge immediately outfitted himself with camping equipment and, and a small skiff. He quickly established a seasonal routine, spending August and September chasing among the northern Chilkoot villages and camping and visiting Indian camps when possible. The couple wintered in Haines and Shotridge made frequent trips on snowshoe, skate, and dog sled, 22 miles north to his own village of Kluckwan, where he spent much of his time the first year. When the weather improved in late March, Shotridge traveled further afield on commercial vessels as far south as Ketchikan and Wrangell to Klawak, Salzar, and Juneau. On this first expedition, Shotridge recorded detailed historical, clan, and genealogical information, primarily from Klukwan and Chilkoot camps. He took dozens of photographic landscapes and portraits, and he inquired about specimens for sale. He also recorded ceremonial songs on wax cylinders. Shotridge began purchasing objects for the museum two years into the trip in 1917. As historical documents have shown, this was a time of profound social change for Tlingit communities. Due to a variety of influences and pressures, such as assimilation to Western society, patrilineal inheritance, and Christianity, many clans were moving away from their traditional ways and selling their clan collections. There were, of course, important family collections in Klukwan, and Shotridge had made four trips there in the late winter and spring of that year. Following descent through his mother's clan, Shotridge had inheritance rights to Kogwantan clan objects. Among his early purchases were three hats from his clan's Klukwan drum house, from the leader of that house. That fall, after losing Florence to tuberculosis, Shotridge traveled briefly to the northern interior, visiting Athabascan families along the Lahini River before returning to participate in potlatches in his own community. In January of 1918, Shotridge was detained in Sitka for three weeks because of bad weather. This provided ample opportunity to learn of the many clan objects for sale there, and he mailed a detailed list of available specimens and photographs to Gordon back at the museum. 
As demonstrated with the drum house hats, Shotridge strove to acquire specimens that represented the leading parties of the Tlingit divisions. That summer, he shipped collections from the Sitka Luknahadi Sea Land House and the Kogwantan Eagle's Nest House to the museum. In Sitka, he, al he also became aware of available collections in other Tlingit communities. Shotridge closed the first expedition in 1918 with a trip, at Gordon's suggestion, into Shimshin territory. Working with informants, he met the leading families of 14 villages along the Nass and Skeena rivers before returning to Haines in the fall to participate in a large potlatch with his Chilkoot party. He returned to the Penn Museum the following spring, where he worked for three years. Shotridge's second Alaskan expedition began in July of 1922 again under Gordon's directorship and with funding of $10,000 from Wanamaker. This trip lasted f for five years. Shotridge's methods and mobility were greatly enhanced in these years with the purchase of a motorboat, the Pen, which he outfitted for cooking and sleeping. Shotridge got to work following his already established seasonal patterns, spending the fall months among Indian camps near Haines, wintering there and making numerous visits to Klukwan. He felt the onrush of modernity in Alaska at the time, and writing to Gordon, he said, quote, it is clear now that unless someone goes to work to record our history in the English language and place these old things as evidence, the noble idea of our forefathers shall be entirely lost, unquote. Shotridge's plan for his first spring and summer was, quote, to go clear down to Cape Fox and to make my way back up systematically photographing and recording notes about all the old villages. By October of the second winter, Shotridge moved his headquarters to the less expensive town of Sitka with its safer winter anchorage, better hunting grounds, and where his second wife and growing family could be closer to her relatives. The move distanced him from his more remote northern home communities and effectively broadened his access to a variety of Tlingit clan histories. In Sitka, Shotridge rented a room where he would write during the days in quiet away from his now two young sons. He conducted a close study of native home life there in 1924. This slide shows a portion of Shotridge's characteristically detailed monthly expense accounts in which he noted the purchase of writing paper, pencils, erasers, stamps, and uh, the rental of a quiet space to write. From Shotridge that winter, aware that Gordon, Emmons, and Goddard of the American Museum were also collecting in Alaska at the time, Shotridge explained his unique collecting strategy. Quote, from the time the white man was attracted by the unique workmanship in, these, in things among the Northwest Pacific Coast peoples, artifacts of various types have been generously taken out from the seemingly inexhaustible supply in the storehouse of the Tlingit people. Yet, strange to say, the collectors and the curio buyers have never approached that which is most important, and that is objects which represent the honorable history of the people." Unquote. Spending his funds carefully, Shotridge's choices reflected this goal. Shotridge continued to provide a good source of Tlingit, I'm sorry, Sitka continued to provide a good source of Tlingit objects. Concerning the wolf baton of the Sitka Kogwantan, he wrote, Quote, I paid a rather high price for that one because it represents an interesting and important history of the party which owned it, unquote. But when offered the Kogwantan house front, the wolf at maternity, he declined the purchase since Gordon was interested in older, finer things. The house front was weathered and appeared older than its 18 years, and Shotridge knew that it had been made for the centennial potlatch of 1904. Though clan histories were his priority, Shotridge also chose objects on typological grounds. Referring to another Sitka collection, he wrote, quote, since the Luknahadi clan history is well represented in the collection already obtained, I hesitate to pay a price which seems rather high for the one in the photo. However, it might be a good thing to have a complete collection of these ceremonial batons, one from every important clan. In addition to making collections of objects, Shotridge worked very hard to document Tlingit communities and points of geographical significance in photographs. This work also reflects his interest in the systematic recording of Tlingit history. Writing from Haines in June of 1924, he summarized the work just completed in a letter to Gordon. 
quote, since the social divisions of the people are based on geographical layout, one has to appreciate it. I plan to create a detailed itinerary of the whole of the southeastern Alaskan region, the course of the early migration of the Tlingit people, unquote. Between May and December of that year, Shotrich traveled in the pen to a record 16 different communities. One voyage describes, deserves special mention because it explains his interest and systematicity in tracing the early migrations of the Tlingit people. His journey was recapped with characteristic detail in the following letter to Gordon. Um, I'm most interested in the last paragraph here, and um, I won't read the first two because it's awfully long. The last paragraph reads, this voyage practically covers the whole of the southeastern Alaska region, particularly the course of the early migration of the Tlingit people. I made a brief stop at all the old villages, most of which had long been abandoned, and of those bearing evidence of former importance, I made a good collection of photographs. I picked up also a few good old specimens which I have now shipped to the museum. After documenting the southern points of migration, Shotrich continued to collect objects, information, and photographs from the neighborhood divisions of Angoon, Huna, Cake, and Juno. He had already acquired fine collections of the Deshitan clan of Angoon and of the Tukwintan from, from Huna. In 1925 and 1926, he turned down leading clan collections in Angoon because the prices were too high. He anxiously considered objects of the Tequidi clan, whose history he had not yet recorded. Quote, the old skin shirt represents the main crest object of the once great clan. Therefore, it was well known among the Tlingit people, unquote. He also returned to Cake since, he, since photographing there in 1922, but he expressed great disappointment after learning of no specimens of interest there to represent the history of that division. Later that year, he acquired a Taku Kiksadi frog hat in Juneau. In April of 1925, Gordon warned Shotridge that the $10,000 allotted for the expedition would soon run out and suggested that he plan ahead for his return to Philadelphia. Gordon expressed confidence that Shotridge had accumulated enough knowledge to make a comprehensive and authoritative study of the divisions, socially, historically, oops, linguistically, and artistically with collections to illustrate their arts and customs. Resisting the return back east, Shotridge reluctantly sold the pen a year later. He indicated that there were a number of fine old specimens still to be had, and that though the prices were far too high, since the other collectors were all working for commercial purposes, he always had the favor of the sellers. With the money from the sale of the pen, he purchased the Celtine hairpiece, that of the Bride of Tongas. Using the hair pieces as a focal point, Shotridge published a lengthy account of the traditional Tlingit marriage ceremony in the museum journal. Seltine is the distant grandmother of Harold Jacobs, shown here with his father at our museum in 2004. This was the final purchase of the five-year second expedition, which came to a close with Gordon's accidental death in February and Shotridge's return to Philadelphia in October of 1927. Though his strong mentorship with Gordon had ended, Shotridge continued his relationship with the museum through the new director, Horace Jean, who encouraged Shotridge's third and final expedition. At this time, Shotridge's annual salary was $2,500. Shotridge was elected president of the a Alaska Native Brotherhood at the start of this period, and he devoted much of his time to this endeavor. His collecting goals were compatible with the society's progressive and modernist cultural agenda. Shotridge acquired a relatively small number of objects on the third expedition, 16 spruce root baskets in 1930 and another 16 objects in 1931. Among these were the four house posts from his own Kaguantan Finn house, for which he paid $600. Jane received these enthusiastically and suggested the possible renovation of the museum's Northwest Coast Hall. Though there was talk of limited funds since the market crash of 1929, Jane encouraged Shotridge and did his best to support his collecting efforts. Shotridge made use of a motion picture camera in these years, and he made a series of films about root preparation for Tlingit basketry. He wanted to make moving films of all of the old-time Tlingit arts. 
and he had already made an agreement with his A&B members to create a film of the old-time potlatch dances. But by December of 1931, with the onset of the Great Depression, there was serious talk of salary cuts by the city of Philadelphia and director Jane himself. The third expedition came to an end six months later when in May of 1932, along with others at the university, Shotridge's employment was terminated. For the next four years, Shotridge struggled to make ends meet in Alaska. He wrote to Dr. Jane, who enthusiastically helped him secure a job as a cannery inspector. Shotridge died in an accident in August of 1936 and was survived by his third wife and five children. I want to turn now to Shotridge's collection of Tlingit photographs, historical texts, and objects. Through his photography, note-taking, and collecting efforts, Lewis Shotridge succeeded in recording though to differing degrees, his, the histories of the leading families across at least eight of the traditional Tlingit geographical divisions. His, his Tlingit object collection consists of 338 pieces, and Shratrich's primary objective was to tell important clan histories of the leading families through their clan art. He also collected household items and tools and things of everyday life, like the halibut hooks shown here. Shotridge's photographic collections include 500 black and white images, the majority of which he labeled. There are several portraits from the northern villages, and for most of these, the subjects' names are listed. And though Shotridge did not identify the individuals in this picture, Evelyn Hotch of Klaquan has identified them as her grandparents, Annie and Victor Hotch. And on the right here, I've listed some of the Tlingit names that are actually recorded in uh, Shotridge's photographs. And this is the kind of thing that we need help on. If um, you could help us identify these photographs as well as help us um, understand the objects even at a deeper level and to look together at Shotridge's records. Shotridge was fastidious and systematic in his note and record keeping. His paper documents include 1,707 papers in his own hand, letters, monthly lists of expenses, price lists, packing, and shipping lists. These documents reveal Shotridge's general practice of buying clan objects from clan leaders and housemasters. His ethnographic notes, which number over 500 pages, cover at least 22 topics with emphasis on language, clan histories, origin stories of emblematic clan objects, historical accounts of wars and genealogies. The Shotridge Digital Archive Project. The Shotridge collection is of great significance to Tlingit people because it represents their cultural patrimony and cultural heritage. To date, one third of the object collection has been claimed for repatriation under NAGPRA by five separate Tlingit entities. At the present time, some of these claims are incomplete or inactive and the museum is actively working to evaluate others. Because of these claims and the significance of Shotridge's unique accomplishments, the time is indeed right for the museum to create a digital archive of the Shotridge collection in its entirety. And we have put this work at the top of our agenda. The project involves a commitment by the museum's American section, the museum archives, Central Council of Tlingit and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska, and Penn's Schoenberg Center for Electronic, Electronic Text and Imaging, which is a division of the Penn Library. Archives are important repositories that create safe houses for records of valued resources. They are also places where meaningful research can be conducted. A digital archive of the Shotridge collection will make all of its resources, objects, images, and Shotridge's writings accessible to the public for research and educational purposes over the World Wide Web. There are there are innumerable ways in which the Shotridge Digital Archive can be of assistance to Tlingit people in their efforts to revitalize Tlingit culture. As I hope I've shown today, his records are an important source of Tlingit clan histories that can renew relationships to clan names and ancestors, help revitalize the clan system and cultural traditions, and provide new re resources for language study and retention. In conclusion, Lewis Shotridge felt the onrushing tide of modernity in the 19-teens and 1920s in Alaska. And in response, he devoted his life work to recording the history of his Tlingit people and to finding a safe place for Tlingit clan regalia where it would be seen on a world stage. 
Adopting Western methods and technologies, Shotridge worked systematically to record a comprehensive Tlingit history that emphasized the clan system from the Tlingit point of view. He intended to write a book on the subject, but because of extenuating circumstances of the Great Depression and his own death, his work was left unfinished. For this reason, I suggest that it is only fair to evaluate Shotridge by taking an all-inclusive view as of his 11 years of fieldwork with Penn. Surely, as Milburn, Seton, and others have shown, his efforts and his experience involved incidents of cultural conflict and tension in a surround of competing cross-cultural dynamics of identity, power, and authority. Accepting these tensions, I have tried to follow Shotridge's footsteps in an effort to better understand his actions and as well as the many gifts that he has left us. Shotridge's history was much more than clan objects alone or the acts of their taking and display as metonyms of Tlingit culture. Tlingit history, from his point of view, is a dynamic combination of geography, language, narrative, spirituality, and art, and one where future generations are deeply implicated. I agree with the Downhowers, who suggest that Shotridge was indeed a visionary. And though he may not have envisioned a digital archive of his own collection, I'm certain that Lewis Shotridge would have... Uh-oh. Dalton, I'm the curator of collections at the Sheldon Jackson Museum here in Sitka. I've been with the museum for 21 years now. Um, for 17 of those years, I was the interpretive specialist. During that time, I had um, the opportunity to um, uh, go back to school, get my master's degree in museum studies. And when um, Peter Coy, the former curator, uh, retired back in, 19, in 2002, five years ago, I can't believe it, um, uh, I became the, the curator and I have been there uh, now for almost five years in that position. When I wrote my thesis, uh, my topic was going to be on Sheldon Jackson, the collector. I wanted to find out, I'm working in this museum, you know, how did these things get to this museum? Why, when, where? And so I did do my thesis um, on Sheldon Jackson, the collector. And then last fall, the Alaska uh, State Historical Society and Museums Alaska at their annual meeting, one of their topic was, um, why did they come? What were they seeking? So I thought, okay, well, this is a time to maybe talk about Sheldon Jackson. So I developed this um, shorter version of Sheldon Jackson, the collector, and I entitled it Sheldon Jackson, Plunderer or Preserver, because I know that um, uh, he certainly has had that, um, uh, that reputation. I hope that through this um, presentation, we can take a look at um, uh, some of the things that Jackson did and why and how. Sheldon Jackson, missionary, educator, philanthropist, and collector. Was he, as many have labeled him, a plunderer? of native material culture, or was he a preserver that has made it possible for the coming generations of natives to see how their fathers lived? This paper is not meant to praise or to condemn Jackson, but merely to shed some light on his role as a collector. How did this one man, in a duplicious sort of way, preserve the material culture of the people whose lives he came to Alaska to change? We'll take a look at why he collected, and then we'll take a look at some examples of things that he collected that otherwise may have been lost during the upheavals of the late 19th and early 20th century, and what the results of those pieces um, have been, of preserving those pieces has been. How did Sheldon Jackson end up in Alaska? He was a successful Presbyterian missionary uh, and church leader 20 years before he arrived in Alaska. For nearly 10 years, from 1859 to 1869, he traveled throughout the Midwest with duties similar to a circuit rider, but finally settled in as a pastor at a church in Rochester, Minnesota. Following this assignment, he became the missionary superintendent um, of Iowa and an area encompassing western Iowa, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Utah. 
Jackson, never one to interpret literally his appointments, had within a year added Colorado and before the end of the decade, New Mexico, Arizona, Washington, and Alaska to his territory. While in these areas, Jackson began collecting objects from Native American um, tribes to use to illustrate talks to the legislators, to church, and educational groups on the East Coast. He even sent Native American material culture to donors as premiums or thank yous for their support. In 1877, Jackson planned to visit Montana to set up new churches and check on others that he had founded uh, in those parts of the West, but he was di denied access because of the Nez Pierce War. This became the opportunity that he was looking for to get to Alaska, a place he had wanted to come to um, since the transfer of Alaska to the United States in 1867. So instead of going to Montana, he headed to Portland, Oregon, where he met Amanda McFarlane, a longtime friend from the Southwest whose husband had recently died. Jackson convinced her to go to Fort, La to go to Fort Wrangell um, with him as an unofficial representative of the Presbyterian Church and begin a school. He accompanied McFarland as her escort to the wild frontiers of Alaska. This first trip only lasted a few weeks and he focused on getting McFarland settled into her school. Well, I guess we're gonna have to look at that picture. Too bad, because there's some really neat pictures in here too I would like to um, share. In the southwest and Rocky Mountain region, Jackson had been both a pot hunter and they ruined the ruins in the abandoned villages and a customer of the emerging tourist arts. His finds continue to enhance the East Coast lectures and appease his supporters, but after his first trip to Alaska, he concentrated on developing a cabinet of curiosities for his alma mater. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay. The Princeton, uh, for his alma mater at the Princeton Theological Seminary. While attending seminary in 1858, he had been impressed by a cabinet of curios put together by Mr. Bush, a former missionary of Siam. Jackson felt he had learned through the objects and Mr. Bush's explanations, quote, more than ever before of their customs, dress, etc., end quote. Although collecting seemed to have been inherent in the man, the idea of using objects to educate others became the spark igniting the flame of all other collecting. Following this first visit in 1877, Jackson began in earnest to make arrangements for the Princeton Theological Seminary to develop the Sheldon Jackson Home Mission Collection. Two, year, two years later, his cabinet became a reality. Although still working in the Southwest, in the spring of 1877, he arranged for the Board of Home Missions to send John G. Brady, I'm right on it. I'll just go ahead and keep reading so not to take up too much more time, but maybe we can get, um, get the slides in and go through them real quick. They also became Jackson's, um, Brady and Hall also became Jackson's field collectors, um, not only for his home mission collections and later his museum um, in Sitka, but also for the donors, uh, premiums, and exhibitions at World's Fairs. Although popular belief has Jackson and his have delayed their conversion, I have not found any documentation supporting this. Yeah, go ahead. Just, if you can fix it, that'd be great. I have not found any documentation supporting this as Jackson's reason for collecting. In fact, Jackson's missionaries and teachers referred to these objects as having been traded, purchased, or given as gifts. Jackson was not so naive as to think that he could buy off or change native customs by, by depleting their material culture. His personal interest in native cultures and his confidence in education for affecting change would have negated the need to collect or as some have often mistakenly assumed destroyed material uh, culture to advance the conversion process. The seeming readiness of some Native people to turn over material culture as a symbol of adapting to a new way of life is interpreted by some as simply another way that Native peoples were indirectly co coerced into parting with important ceremonial and sacred... Okay. Hmm. We'll take a look at some of the objects that Jackson collected during his years in Alaska and what happened to them. Jackson made a second trip to Alaska in 1879 
bring along his wife, Mary, a group of church officials, and a new missionary teacher bound for Fort Wrangell. Famed naturalist John Muir also happened to be on that same trip. After making a stop at Fort Wrangell, the mail steamer California, California and her passengers okay, uh, went on board. Um, Select your, uh, okay. you need to find your file. Okay, it should be right. Edit for Wrangell, that's not the one I want. Mm -hmm. so that's not the one I want. Let's go ahead and put the disc in. I think it's our oh, crap, it's in Sue's. I should have it on here though. I'm going to have to have the disc. Their mission here in Sitka, they headed south um, after an aborted attempt to reach Haines in the Chilkat country. The group cruised in bays and inlets and formed, uh, formed by glaciers, giving John Muir the chance to make natural history observations and providing a scenic cruise for Jackson and the rest of the party. Jackson reportedly kept up a barrage of questions to Muir concerning the natural wonders of the Muir, in his account of the trip and travels to Alaska, noted his disappointment about the canceled trip to the Chilkat country uh, because of the rumors of glaciers he heard there. But he re received assur assurances from the archaeological doctor that they would most certainly find stone axes, okay, here we go, and some, curio uh, some curiosities amongst the old buildings and totem poles of the old Stikin village, a dozen miles south of Fort Wrangell. Okay, I'm going to just run through these very quickly until I get up to where I am. If anyone does happen to know what this, where this unidentified village is, I'm sure that uh, the folks over at the State Historical Library would love to know that. Um, reaching the village, the group indeed found the 50-year-old ruins of, of the Clinket town site. After disembarking, Muir stayed with the group only a short time before striking out on his own to sketch and take notes of that area. After time, he heard what sounded like the chopping and felling of a tree. Returning to the site, Muir found that the most eager of the relic hunters, obviously Sheldon Jackson, had requested that the steamer's deckhands cut down one of the most interesting of the totems with a view to take it on east to enrich some museum or the other. That's a quote from John Muir. The group's clinket guide, Kedishan, whose clan claimed ownership of the pole, approached Jackson and posed a thought-provoking question to him. Quote, how would you like to have an Indian go to a graveyard and break down and carry away a monument belonging to your family?" End quote. A rather uncomfortable moment for Jackson, but Kavishan, a recent convert to Presbyterianism, accepted Jackson's apologize, apologies and gifts and allowed him to ship the pole away. What would have happened to this pole if Jackson had left it where it stood? From our 2006 perspective, 2007 perspective, his actions of taking the pole may seem reprehensible. Why not let the pole stay, as Kadashan had said, as a monument belonging to his clan? And how would we feel if someone went to a, cem to a cemetery where our ancestors' remains were interred and took them away? <coughs> Jackson's actions certainly seem to land him in the plunderer category. However, we should not forget that this is also the man who wanted to preserve, quote, the best specimens so that the coming generations of natives could see how their fathers lived. But did the means justify the end, the preservation of an object that the owners would have let fall back to earth? How valuable is it for the ancestors of the people who raised the pole to have it today as a link to their past? 
It may not be in its original location, but it has survived. This became the greatest irony in Jackson's years in Alaska. He came to Alaska to change the Native's way of life and encourage them to put aside their cultural values. Yet he aggressively preserved some of the most important material culture for the benefit of future generations. Today, the top portion of the pole, this piece here, remains preserved at the Princeton Art Museum uh, as an important artifact and an inspiration and as a symbol of the strong and sophisticated sophisticated cultures that erected it nearly 200 years ago. By the early 1800s, Jackson was collecting in high gear, sending most of the materials he was collecting to his alma mater at the Princeton Theological Seminary. His feeling, which reflected many 19th century collectors, was, quote, the present moment is the last to preserve these evidences of the culture of the races of the old masters of our continent, which are rapidly disappearing before the rushing tide of civilization, end quote. But it wasn't until 1887, when a group of high-powered educators, businessmen, and church leaders on tour with Jackson suggested the need for an organization in Alaska for scientific investigation, an organization that would also be a venue for the growing number of objects that Jackson was collecting. Realizing he was the means by which important material culture was leading Alaska, Jackson, with the aid of the newly formed Alaskan Society of Natural History and Ethnology became enthusiastically, uh, began enthusiastically collecting for the Sitka Museum. He convinced his supporters to construct a building to house the artifacts that he was collecting at a place, quote, for the study of the students, the best specimens of the old works of their ancestors, end quote. First, this frame structure was constructed but was soon too small, and in 1895, it was replaced by a concrete structure which continues to house the collections today. He encouraged the continuation of arts, such as weaving and carving, um, unfortunately not for traditional purpose, but for creating objects for sale in the growing art market, thus engaging the native population in the new cash economy brought by Europeans and Americans. Carving and weaving classes became a part of the curriculum of Sheldon Jackson Training School. The Sheldon Jackson Museum um, houses a huge number of objects. We're going to talk about a few specific things that are in the collection. In May of 1888, Jackson traveled to Metlakatla to visit William Duncan and the group of Christianized Simpsons that Duncan had brought to settle in Metlakatla. It so happened the site that was chosen was along abandoned Clinkett Village. While there, Jackson made arrangements for 34 young Simshian men to attend the Sitka Industrial and Training School. Meanwhile, Jackson learned that two Clinkett totem poles left in the village would soon be destroyed by the new Simshian settlers. I can see one right here. <coughs> On hearing this, Jackson suggested that the poles be shipped to Sitka with the young men. Most likely, the poles were placed, as shown in this picture, outside of the first, um, somewhere outside at the school. Uh, the first museum building was not completed in 18, until 1890. The poles had no significance to the Christianized Simshian people, and the original Clinket inhabitants had been gone for 50 years. Again, we must ask ourselves if the taking of the poles constituted plundering after such an absence of the owners, or whether they should have been left for destruction by the new residents. Would the Simshian of Metlakatla have been considered plunderers if they had destroyed the poles? Couldn't their removal be considered truly an act of preservation on Jackson's part, since otherwise their disappearance would have been sealed by the Simshian? These two bowl, poles have been connected to the Sheldon Jackson Museum since their arrival in 1888. They have been viewed by countless visitors and have been ex examined by many researchers. One search re such researcher, Steve Brown, has used one of these poles in his search to identify the works of an early Clinkett carver. Brown's theory is that this pole is the earliest work of a master carver, and uh, forgive my pronunciation, Kajistuak, who also carved the house posts associated with Chief Shake's house in Wrangell. Though comparing the surviving 
with photographs and other polls in Wrangell, Kassan, and Klaquan, Brown has put together a major body of knowledge on the artistic legacy of this particular uh, Clinkett artist from the early 1800s. Brown notes that, quote, the Sheldon Jackson Museum can be proud to be custodian of a few pieces of this inspiring legacy. Jackson's forethought in bringing the polls to the museum has helped in the study and analysis of Northwest Coast art and recognized the talent and creativity of a man considered to be the finest woodcarver of his time and his, whose work has stood the test of time and is st still highly regarded by contemporary artists. Again, the central irony of Jackson's life was that he actively worked to impose change. He nonetheless preserved aspects of, of Alaska's traumatized cultures for posterity. In so doing, he preserved objects so that the people whose ancestors had made and used them might study and learn from them. Consequently, that preservation has in some instances assisted in the revitalization of those cultures. Jackson's collecting has unquestionably extended far beyond preserving material culture for Alaska only. Since his first lectures to Eastern audiences using Atlantic slides and curios, Jackson's work has served to educate and enlighten people from around the world. Some of his collections were exhibited in the Seattle World's Fair in 1962 and at the far north um, 2,000 Years of American Eskimo and Indian Art, which he opened at the Smithsonian the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. in 1973. From this large exhibition came a smaller one, which traveled to Alaska and five other sites around the country. The artifacts collected by Jackson have also been loaned to the San Francisco Folk Art Museum, the Anchorage Museum of History and Art, the Shedd Aquarium in, uh, in Chicago. The Yupik Mask Exhibit, Our Way of Making Prayer, used many of the masks collected by Jackson in southwestern Alaska. Some of the Jackson collected pieces housed at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. traveled in 1991 with the International Exhibition of Alaskan and Siberian Cultures, Crossroads of the Continents. Other pieces from the Sheldon Jackson Museum, Museum have been loaned to the Tacoma Historical Society, Anchorage Museum of History and Art in 1983, and as part of the traveling exhibit, Russian America, the Forgotten Frontier. Since Jackson's death, literally hundreds of thousands of people have had the opportunity to further their understanding and appreciation of the indigenous peoples of the North Pacific Rim. Researchers, scholars, and publishers from around the world continue to request photographs and information on the material culture collected by Dr. Jackson over 100 years ago. Each year, hundreds of local and out-of-town school groups utilize the Sheldon Jackson Museum as a primary educational resource. The pride that many Native children take in the materials they find in the museum is a testament to Jackson's foresight in creating it. In addition, dozens of artists and craftsmen visit the museum in order to see examples of how their ancestors wove baskets and textiles, crafted kayaks, or carved in wood, bone, ivory, and silver. Moreover, um, Native artists in the museum gallery present their arts and crafts each summer, sharing stories, legends from their culture, and talk and visit with thousands of visitors from every state and dozens of countries around the world. There are many opinions of Sheldon Jackson, the collector, or maybe I should say on Sheldon Jackson himself. I would like to mention a few comments I've heard over the years. Dave Galan, the Clinket artist, feels Jackson's collecting has given him opportunities to find inspiration for his work, which otherwise might not have been available to him. The Sheldon Jackson Museum provides Galan and others like him with the opportunity to do as its namesake intended, to see up close how their fathers lived. Many feel that the regalia and the other objects should not be behind glass, but should continue to be used for special occasions by the groups from which they originated. And as we have seen, that is happening today. <clears throat> Still others, such as Yupik scholar Trina McIntyre, recently told me, quote, the museums house the wondrous works for all to see, appreciate, and be inspired. They are the caretakers of our civilizations and artistic dreams. In 1988, the Coastal Yukon Mayors Association hosted a small exhibit entitled Opening the Book. The exhibit consisted of artifacts Jackson collected from villages in the Bering Sea and Lower Yukon River, and then deposited in the museum in Sitka. Dr. Jackson's work of collecting received a standing ovation um, for having preserved the artifacts from that area. Although the exhibit brochure puts ownership of the artifacts in the hands of the people of Alaska with the Sheldon Jackson Museum as their place of storage, 
the brochure further states, quote, these objects belong to you, the people of the Lower Yukon, uh, Lower Yukon, because it was your cultures be acceptable today. Yet Jackson's work is appreciated as expressed by the Yukon Kuskokwim people who gave a special thank you to Sheldon Jackson for collecting and saving the artifacts in the exhibit and keeping them in Alaska. Was Sheldon Jackson a plunderer or a preserver? These are questions about which many have strong feelings and to which I offer my response. Yes, he acquired, or some would say plundered, important material culture from people in transition and in some instances may have done it in a way that is unacceptable today and we could label him a plunderer. And yes, he was a preserver so that the coming generations of natives can see how their fathers lived. And so today, at 100 years from now, all can see, learn, and marvel at the works of the old masters of our continent. Thank you. Gunas Tish. Okay. Questions? And as I was researching some of the regalia for this dance regalia documentary project that Donna, my partner here, is, and I are working on, um, I recognize Jenny's um, uh, weavings. And for those of you who don't know who Jenny Clonard is, she was the last of the traditional Chilkat weavers. She passed away in 1986 at the age of 95, 96. Anyways, it was pretty amazing and quite moving to see my teacher's um, uh, weavings, and I recognized them right off the bat by not just her weaving style, but by her signature, um, which is the yellow and blue checkerboard signature. Not the black and white, or the blue and white, or blue and black. And mine is yellow and white. Hers is um, the yellow and blue checkerboard. Bottom right hand corner of the chill cat rope, bottom right hand and left hand corner where the uh, where the um, side fringe tie offs are. Um, anyways, I um, I wanted to talk about something that you know it's a personal experience, but I think that many of you might be uh, can relate to um, some of this some of the perspectives I have on museums, a main perspective, and that is, um, I know that some people have wanted to see, uh, hear what I had to say, especially the museum people, I'm sure, uh, what I had to say about um, a native perspective on the, the function of museums in our lifetime. Um, can you guys hear me? If I talk like this, I'd rather talk like this than on a microphone that I'm stuck to a to a podium. If you can wait, can wait just a moment. Okay. Is there a, a microphone that goes like this? Oh yeah. I can give you one for the video, but I don't have one for the speakers. Okay. I don't know if there's if that's a good idea. I might cuss or something. <laughs> I might pick it up on the camera. <laughs> so, so what I wanted to, um, okay, back in November, I was, like I said, I had this uh, fellowship to go visit several museums, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Boston, Cambridge, Washington, D.C., and um, my first visit was in Washington, D.C., and I was there for a couple of days looking at the vast, huge uh, collection, overwhelming. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Terry Rathar has, Evelyn Vanderhoop, you know. Megan, Megan has seen it. Um, it's, it's huge, overwhelming. It will bring tears to your eyes. It may cause all kinds of emotions of awesomeness and anger and uh, grief, um, all those negative feelings, but also the positive feelings, like you know, where do you, any of us start? Bigger than the 
the hall in here. Twice as big. Twice as big as the, the hall. Times as big as the hall here. And you know what was really cool about it? I asked myself, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Here, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed here. How am I going to handle this emotional rush? Because I realized that for us, I was like visiting my relatives. And many of us have that feeling when we are handling our regalia. So I kind of asked my left-hand corner, and that comes in about left, uh, 11 o'clock. It's my inner voice. I ask a question, and it's the very first thought that comes in about this far away. Arms length away. We all have one. And I asked, <coughs> I need some help here. I need to gain some kind of perspective, you know, something quick here to help me move through the next three weeks of research through all these museums, attics, basements, collections that are held in these places where the sun doesn't shine. So, backing up. When I was a kid and we went to museums, the only time we went to the museums was when we were doing anything that had to do with schoolwork. Not because our parents brought us there, not because our aunts or our brothers or sis sisters brought us there. It was because of schoolwork and we were doing research. Now when we came, when I, when I walked down the areas, the hallways, the areas of these museums and saw all these mannequins that were kind of, you know, skin tones and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the way I'm getting lately. <laughs> um, I, I was a little bit, uh, I felt like I was walking into a cave, a dark cave, dead, where no life existed, and where I just wanted to move quickly in all these things, and I, I didn't even know what any of these things were. Like, did they mean anything? Did they mean anything to me? I just wanted to move quickly through the space and get out of there. Dimly lit, dusty, behind glass, untouchable, don't even breathe on it. I don't know if you guys remember that. Do you guys remember any of that? Or is this just my personal experience? Yeah? So I didn't really care for museums. And most of my life, I didn't care for museums, and I never really used them. Once or twice, I went down to the State Museum to look at Chilcat robes. That's because my, some of my students wanted to look at some old robes, and that's what we did. We went down to the, um, to the museums, and there they were in these drawers. Now, I was asked by a filmmaker after we went down and visited them. This is the one that was the documentary on the six Chilcat weavers by uh, Barb Cranmer. We all went down, we inspected the robes and a few tunics. Then we got done and we all came back up and out of the basement and we were having a meal together and the filmmaker asked me, Clarissa, what did you think about the, all, seeing all those robes in the drawers? Now, I think she expected me to say, oh, they're being held captive, you know, or, oh, they should belong to us, they should come back to us. No, I didn't say that. My response was, and I still feel this way, they're incubating. Mm -hmm. They're incubating. Initially, when a Chilcat weaver weaves a robe, or anyone makes any piece of regalia, generally what the, it's used for, what our intentions are, is that they will be, that the regalia will be used by the people that we intended them to be used for and what they were supposed to be used for, which is the ceremonies and dance and songs. <coughs> and so those creators of all the Chilcat robes in the past made each robe to be woven 
for ceremonial use. Now, as a weaver and maker of regalia, we don't know the life of that so-called child. It is like a child because we carry this thing around with us, this precious thing. It's so much work, nine months worth of work, if you're really good at it. And I'm good. I can do it in six, but don't tell anybody else. <laughs> um, so, coming back to that thought, when we weave a robe, the initial intention, when we make a button robe, sew a button robe, when we make a carved hat, it is for ceremonial use, generally speaking. Most of us, that's what we use it for. We don't know where it's going to end up. You know, the first year, it may go to your uncle. Next year, it goes to someone else and it gets handed down. So those robes that I saw 100 years ago, they were made. 200 years ago, they were made. 200 years ago, they were collected or whatever and they're now so-called incubating in this space. They are not dead. They still have the life and the history and the spirit of those who wore that robe, those who wove the robe. So to me, we're just incubating and spirit doesn't know time and space. Energy is energy. So, going back to my experience at NMA, through the NMAI Fellowship and doing three weeks worth of research in seven or eight museums, that very first day, I had to ask for some help. I had to ask for some help to get through three weeks of visits of relatives, people I had not met in this reality, maybe in another reality, maybe in my dreams, but not in this one. But I could feel the power of it as soon as I opened that door and there I stood. Huge, big, huge box. And the interesting thing was, you know how we have that story about box within a box within a box? That's what this place was like huge box and this big huge box that I found out was a box and in that box were all these little boxes and what happened was I asked my left hand corner okay give me some perspective here I need some assistance and the answer was this perspective that I'm going to give to you now Shall I read, or shall I just go on like this? Just go on like this? I need to read. <laughs> uh, I need to. Just think of it this way. Imagine this big, huge room and this big box. And I'm going to talk about the box, okay? Because it correlates with our legends of the box within the box within the box. Imagine this huge room, and you walk in, you don't know what you're doing. You walk in, the guy leads you in, and he leads you in, you sit down, you, you set down your, your camera and your coat and your computer and your notebooks and, you know, your gloves. And he said, yeah, you leave those things here, and then we're going to go over here. So we go over here, and it's this huge box, and I'm looking for the door. <laughs> and the ceilings are about 30 feet high. There's this big box that's about 20 feet high, and who knows how long. It's way down there. I'm looking for the door. Where's the door? Where's the door? No, no, no. He pushes a button. <laughs> he pushes a button, and this panel about this wide, and who knows, 150 feet. 100, 100 feet long, it parts like this. Here's, a, here's the wall. Here's this section, panel. 
that parts like Moses parting the Red Sea. <laughs> It's this wide, just wide enough for this electrical <laughs> thing that you stand on, you press the button, and you go up. It's an electrical ladder. Shelves 20 feet up, boxes in those shelves. How many have, of you have been to this place that I described? Yeah. Don't go alone. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go alone, really. Donna was supposed to go with me. Gee whiz. USGS wouldn't let her go. And so there's all these boxes, and you come in, and you go, oh, and then the guy just comes in, and he brings in the electrical elevator ladder, and it goes up and down, and you scoot it up some more, and go up and down. And the interesting thing is I was so overwhelmed, I only went through that row and I only got done with maybe this section all the way back to the back room, but the row was three or four lengths of this space. And I was there for the entire day. You can imagine seeing all these masks, carved boxes, rows of carved boxes, huge, amazing carved boxes on these shelves. You get to a place where you're just going, yeah, hi. Oh my God, look at this guy. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> and that's what you do. And you visit this basket. You know, I don't want to touch it. That's a good one right there. And so what happens here is, and I think most of us do this, we go and start talking to the pieces as if, as if like I said, there are relatives. And I, I thought I was going nuts. Well, I didn't care. And this guy knew. He'd seen it before, probably. So with that description, I'm going to go with this. We people along the Northwest Coast, we store our ceremonial regalia at Uru the sacred objects in large carved cedar bentwood boxes. Well, nowadays it's those plastic totes that are rubber made. <laughs> These clan possessions are brought out for special occasions such as the potlatch, the kui, the adoption or naming of someone, a wedding, a funeral. I know of a robe that was brought out once in 60 years the family didn't even know that we had it. It was when my Aunt Catherine Mills died. It was brought out during her 40-day party. As soon as I walked in, everyone says, Clarissa, is that a Jenny Clannot robe? Everyone gathered around, and I looked. It was across the room of the A&B Hall. I knew it was hers. I could tell by her style. 60 years. None of her children knew that they had this role. During any of these, during any of these events, these adoptions, namings, potlatches, much money is spent on its production. Thousands of dollars are taken in and eventually given out. Many people work to coordinate the event. The production of these elaborate clan events may take up to several years to plan. Clan members send out invitations for the event at least a year in advance. Up to a thousand people may attend. Yet, most of a clan object's life, most of our regalia, <coughs> is spent stored in large carved boxes, incubating until the t next time it is called upon to be viewed in ceremony or to be worn. In the meantime, the ceremonial objects have appointed clan caretakers, the temporary keepers of the objects, who store the object carefully, attending to any repairs, and attend to its well-being, like a family member.
Some of these ceremonial clan objects were collected and are stored in many museums across North America. They were collected a long time ago. Some are collected even now. Every museum has its own storage method. Each item is assigned a number for easy reference and location. Some objects are stored in low, flat boxes set amongst other boxes side by side in shelving cabinets. Some are stored in large, flat metal drawers in very large cabinets in height from floor to ceiling among hundreds and hundreds of other small, flat boxes. Some of the objects were collected by way of purchase, trade, theft, up to 200 plus years ago, and were put into storage and have never been seen since. These large metal storage containers in these museums, like our Bentwood boxes, house our ceremonial clan objects that remain dormant, remain waiting until a visitor comes along or an event takes place. A hired caretaker, the keeper of the, job, the objects in these museums, carefully stores each item, attends to its well-being, and accommodates any visitors. A special occasion may call upon a specific object to come out, to be viewed amongst other related items of its nature, to what the museums call an exhibit. The museum plans at least two years in advance for the event to take place, and sometimes the exhibit, the exhibit may travel to another museum or another institution in several towns for several years. Thousands of dollars are taken in to produce the exhibit and given out. Many people work to coordinate the event. Announcements are sent out, and unlike the native people's more intimate relationship where we generally know and invite the opposite clan members, the whole world is invited to view the exhibit. Then, when the exhibit has come to term, the, ter the items are returned to their respective storage containers, returning to their large metal boxes the box, within the box, hmm. within the greater box. And they may never see the light of day for another 50 to 100 years. Think about that. I never understood that, really, I never really saw the position of the museums as being, as having so-called caretakers. Well, I, I met several of those caretakers. They're just as passionate and attached to the pieces as we saw with Harold Jacobs last night and how he transferred the objects these sacred objects to his father's clan. These caretakers in these museums are fabulous people. Every one of them I met. I didn't have that perspective before. I didn't really know how the museums function or anything. And I'm not trying to pat the museums on the back here. I'm just giving you a perspective of our boxes and their boxes. And that right now, our relatives are housed in these, in this so-called foreign land, and yet they are almost 
I say almost. These objects are almost just as well loved as the, the land that they came from by the people of the land that they came from. This was my own way. This is my own spirit's way. This is my left hand corner's way of granting me the grace by which I could survive three weeks of research amongst hundreds and hundreds of relatives all at once. Can you imagine being in a place like this, hundreds of relatives and friends to see all at once and you can't visit them all? It's already bad enough the way it is now, here. I can't talk to everybody like Bob Sam was saying, all day I've been pulled this way and that way. Somebody wants me to go this way and that way. That's exactly like how all these people, pieces were, these people. These, yes, people pieces were, these objects, these clan objects were in, in the reality of each visit that I made. Here's all these people that I saw. I, you know, and I, oh, and I saw these masks and oh my God, you know, and I'm way up high and the machine is going up and, whoa, hey, I'll see you later. You know, that's how it was. I'll see you later. Yeah, yeah, Terry, you know how it is. And you oh, oh, my, oh, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. And that's how it was. So we have, and I know all of us have this, and the non-Native people have experienced this themselves in watching how we behave with our clan objects. We have this respect and regards to a, a robe or an entire shaman's outfit or whatever as if that is a true living being. That's because to us it is, especially when you have seen so-and-so and so-and-so and your great-grandfather and your great your grandfather and your and your father and then your your own self wearing these things and there and then and then you know it has all that energy it has all that power that that memory so it is like visiting your relatives definitely so here's my theory on this I said to myself, I was talking to Tom Jimmy, you know, when he and I get together, woo, all kinds of things go all over the place. And I was telling him my experience. And I says, isn't it, do, don't you feel that way, Tommy? Don't you feel as if these objects are like your relatives and that you're visiting these people? And when you put a robe on, it's like, yes, it's like, your grandfather comes to you, your grandma comes to you. And all these people that you've heard about, they come to you and they're with you right then and there in that moment. When this kind of thing happens, don't you feel, Tom, don't you feel like if this were the case and we have thousands and thousands of objects elsewhere, especially in the East Coast, all those museums back there. What are they doing there? How come they're there? Oh, there's this thing called repatriation. We're bringing some of it back. But it's going to be impossible to bring all of it back. So why are our relatives over there? Why? Well, answer to me. They are needed in that landscape. The non-native people needed in that landscape. The native people of that land need the power of our people in that landscape. They need the emotional support. They need the cultural support. There is a certain level of, of guidance and support that these people on the East Coast, the most populated place on this whole continent, they need the spirit, obviously, of the Northwest Coast tribes. Why? Because we're damn good. <laughs> I mean, look at our art. Look at how we wear our histories and our, and our art. 
uh, in our art, every in everything that we have, our, our house posts, our regalia, you know, you know, even tattoos. My daughter wants a tattoo on her back. Oh my God! <laughs> and so it's like, why are they needed there? It's obvious. Otherwise, they would not have been transferred there. Everything leads for the good. Everything, even the negative. Everything leads for the good. That's the way I feel. So I look at this and go, well, yeah. Some of them are coming back home by way of various relatives who are <coughs> asking for them to come home or demanding for them to come home, begging for them to come home. And you know how it is with kids. That's what you got to do sometimes. And so they remain there. Doesn't mean that a hundred years from now something will happen and they'll all come back. In the meantime, we create new pieces. And we create these new pieces to reflect our own stories of what's happening now to reflect our own trials and tribulations, to reflect, you know, any personal um, you know, enlightened experiences you may have. So I look at this and go, well, there are many of us who are regalia makers here and I'm really proud of you. Many of us who are repatriating pieces to come back home. I'm really proud of you. Many of us who are documenting things, researching things, supporting the artists to make the regalia and supporting the artists to do their work, show their work, exhibit their work. We're in a really cool time of transition. And for the museums and the native people to work together. When a museum collects a piece of work, a new piece, an old piece, and they put it behind glass, let that glass be either open at the top or the bottom or it opens out. We can borrow the road, can't we? We borrow the road. Yes, you can house it in your museum. You guys are good caretakers. You bought that piece. That's good. Yeah, it supported the artist. All right. But let that piece come alive. Let that piece bring into itself. Absorb the human spirit and the human heart into that piece. Because that's where you see our work come alive.